Wealth and prestige are power. They're sweat for, sought after, and fought over. The game gives you a rank according to your wealth, which is one of the few tangible ways Dwarf Fortress evaluates you. Earning the highest one involves crazy risks that can kill even the most well-defended of fortresses. Each requires more wealth than the last, and while tales of dwarven riches bring prestige and migrants, the game scales threats it sends after you to that wealth. The wiki even has advice on how to limit how quickly you grow to avoid attracting the wrong kind of attention too early. But I don't have time for any of that. Only one of my previous forts became millionaires, and that took six years. But I want to become a multi-millionaire in just three years to prepare for earning the highest rank, that of a true dwarven mountain home, in just six. Will the aspiring fortress of Orbswomen be legends, or will their legendary ambitions attract invasions that ensures no one even hears their tale? It starts a little differently than most of my fortresses. In addition to the usual miner, leader, militia captain, and so on I almost always bring, I have the ever-capable carpenter Kel and Eton, who thinks they're a farmer but is actually a magnificent cook. They don't know it yet, but these two are going to be renowned amongst all dwarf kind before long. The surrounding trees and plants are immediately marked for harvesting to start the two main industries, woodworking and cooking. The latter will be helped along by the explosion of feathers near the starting wagon. I have no idea how they manage to fit 60 geese on it, but I know that they'll need nest boxes as soon as possible. Once made at a carpenter's shop and placed down, it only takes a few weeks for these to start laying eggs that will quite metaphorically be the foundation the treasury is built on. While geese laid eggs, miners work down below to start tidying things up. There's a ton of fluxstone around here that will eventually be used to forge steel. While metalworking isn't an immediate focus, well-geared soldiers are eventually going to be needed to protect the treasury. The more important part for now is the start of some small spaces for industry carved out near a central staircase. Stoneworking for basic furniture is on one side, while the other side is prepared for the all-important kitchen. A separated butcher those geese will eventually be brought to goes near the kitchen and still, but I brought plenty of ingredients to start things off without sacrificing the cute animals. Eton takes their place in the kitchen, grabs a bunch of raven meat, and cooks it into a stack of lavish meals. The expedition leader and greediest dwarf of all, Risen, becomes a broker who can safely say that the 40 bucks worth of raven meat has become a meal worth thousands. It's not unique either. Eton does this again and again because food is among the best money makers in this game, especially early on. It's how the early wealth will flow in until there's enough people to get bigger industries roaring. The geese above? Well, they're more there to get the early nest boxes filled up, and once they have kids, most of them are going to be headed to the butcher. Since enough nest boxes have been placed, Kel gets to work turning the plentiful logs into beautiful figurines, each worth a solid amount that can be mass produced pretty easily. It's already been a couple of months since they started in early spring, but the dwarves continue to deforest the local area to impress the dwarven merchants that are set to arrive in the fall. The ingredients the wagons brought run out well before then, but fortunately, one of the pack animals was an elephant. And while I do love turning these into beasts of war, I also love hundreds of meat that will be worth tens of thousands once made into meals, plus tons of bones and expensive pelts. Despite that opulence, the plan for now is for dwarves to share a single dorm room so the miner can focus on dwelling down into the rocky core to jumpstart metalworking. Risen gets a similarly simple office to handle their still important tasks of setting up work orders, and they tell themselves that this skimpy place is okay. Soon enough, they'll go down as a queen of opulence even if their poor focus did doom their last adventure. The miner finds the caverns that they were looking for. These large subterranean expanses have valuable resources, but this one is full of water and not suitable for settling. Cavern mud makes for the best farms, which will mean bigger stacks of expensive food, so the miner makes plans to dive deeper and to do a little bit of exploratory mining higher up in search of another cavern. 
While that happens, Eton continues to make food worth thousands. And even if Risen's estimates of how much it's worth is fairly off, prepared meals still make up the bulk of the 13,000 the fortress is worth right now. It's enough to draw a few visiting warriors looking to fight in the caverns we breached, and they soon ask to stay so that they can venture forth and slay evil beasts. We'll definitely accept that invite to protect this place since it's mostly defenseless right now, and there are snake people eyeing the entrance from a stone's throw away. That's definitely getting fixed up and sealed off until I have a military that can actually put up a fight. As that happens, the first migrants come. This wave isn't influenced by wealth, but we're still lucky enough to get a legendary engraver, and even better, a legendary weaponsmith. They'll help make even more migrants come in time, though I doubt metalworking will be here before this first pivotal autumn arrives. That's when the first caravan comes, and the tales they spread about our wealth will determine how many migrants come the following year. No, it's Eton's work in the kitchen that'll carry the weight this first trip, and that means that some of the geese are already going to get butchered as we run out of other food to prepare. The value they create will be helped along by a jeweler and leather worker, who gets started in a much nicer facility because despite this being a challenge run, I'm addicted to aesthetics. And what's the point in having extravagant wealth if you don't live in at least some of it? The muddy floors on the second cavern aren't nearly as nice, but they're far more important. We're gonna wall this off from the exterior, though not before crundles, which are little impolite creatures, sneak in. Fortunately, these are small, weak, and easily handled by the wandering adventurers making their way down to the second caverns. There are some other creatures here, like this sloth-like but peaceful rutherer, but there aren't any other threats yet, so the crundles do little more than delay the walls by scaring off civilians, then fertilizing the ground with their corpses. The few threats that do show up afterwards, like trolls, are both easily handled by the monster slayers that petitioned Orb's Woman to join, and stopped by walls that keep those same monster slayers from ever coming back. They chose to go down there even after the plans for the walls were all drafted up. This is on them. We'll start planting down in the cavernous depths just five months after arriving here. Further below, we even find the warmth that must come from magma miners will slowly and safely tap into to fuel metalworking. A trade depot is built back up on the surface. This is the first milestone, and all the prepared meals have been made for this. The number of migrants you get in the next year are determined by the wealth when the imminent dwarven caravan leaves. More wealth means more people, which will make more wealth in turn for next year's caravan. The traders will see a plethora of wooden figurines and exquisite meals. Though it'll take a bit to actually get everything in front of them, I definitely should have stored these in wooden bins to make for faster transport. Even before most of it's here though, a few figurines and one barrel of food are enough to buy out all of the caravan's useful gear, including their food, instruments, seeds, and a few other miscellaneous goods. That leaves tens of thousands of Orb's Woman's wealth to wow the merchants and tempt them back next year with even more in their wagon. The total wealth of this fortress is already valued at at least 21,000, which is twice as much as most of my fortresses by this point, and it'll be even higher before the caravan leaves. I should note that the value shown here is the minimum value which the broker will estimate. Risen's appraisal skill is still pretty low. Each meal that's actually worth a thousand might be appraised at only three or four hundred by her for now, but the trading caravan knows their real value and will spread tales according to the actual wealth. That's enough figurines for now though, so Kel the Carpenter switches to making bins and barrels. They aren't worth as much, but they'll help the rest of the fortress in storage areas, like what's going to be in the metalworking area near the newly accessed Magma Sea. There's even some adamantine and fancy gems that I won't be going for anytime soon, and if you've seen my latest video on conquering the world in 10 years, you'll know why. Another set of migrants arrive, including a second legendary weaponsmith and a legendary bone carver. We have a ton of bones, and with over 300 goose eggs ready to hatch, we'll have far, far more next year. We'd have even more bones if we went out into the caverns to look for people we maybe left to starve there. 
just don't tell the merchants about that. Instead, tell them about the newly planned metal smelters that go in before they leave, which will surely draw even more wealth to the fortress before they arrive again next autumn. They aren't there to see the gold all around this place get smelted into bars while miners hunt for more precious metals in the long staircase they've already cut out. The first gold bars are turned into wonderful altars that will decorate and use to make exquisite temples, though there will only be a few of those before they start to smelt tetrahedrite and sphalerite down together into brass. Brass is simultaneously fairly valuable and readily available here, which makes it both amazing for training the currently mediocre Ina and for amassing a good amount of wealth. Making a ton of goblets is going to make her a better crafter. Winter's chill is just starting to arrive when the first goose eggs hatch, which is about eight months since they were laid. The little babies take a year to grow into mature geese, but we should have literally hundreds and hundreds of them to make meals out of before the third year's caravan. The legendary engraver is hard at work slowly improving smoothed walls, which does add to their value even if we can't see it like we can with other items. Perhaps more importantly, it helps carry on important histories like elves being crushed. Eneth's journey towards being a legendary metal crafter who makes all kinds of artisanal goods down at the forges has started. They turn one brass bar worth 35 bucks into three goblets, each worth around 80, which will only go up more as Eneth gets better and makes higher quality goods. Printing that much wealth somehow still isn't enough for Irvod and Monum, who try to use the same smithery at the same time. I do appreciate the hustle, you two, but chill out. We still have more than two years to hit our multi-million goal. The golden altars from earlier are decorated with bone, which increase their value slightly, though not by enough to actually be noticeable while Risen's just guesstimated. The expanded kitchen pantry has way too much for 16 dwarves to eat, but fortunately, the traders' tales have finally drawn migrants to help. Lots of migrants. Litast apparently doesn't like the idea of having to learn over 30 new names, and is possessed to make something down in the metalworking area. My last fort got a similarly large migrant wave at the start of the third year, not the second, which means that this fort is already doubling that one's pace. These extra hands are going to be used to jumpstart metalworking, while hunters help the kitchen by bringing back some fairly peaceful chimpanzees that still totally deserved it because they kept going around spooking the geese. Litast finishes their artifact octahedral octahedron to add some 5,000 in value to the fort. It's their attempt to take the role of chief metal crafter away from Eneth, but the hardworking Eneth's penchant for making brass goblets has already made them into an expert metal crafter, so Litast isn't going to get that role anytime soon. The new smelters start to produce steel by smelting hematite and magnetite down into iron, mixing that iron with fluxstone and coke to make pig iron, then mixing iron, pig iron, and fluxstone to finally make steel ingots. It's too labor intensive to be nearly as profitable as the similarly valued brass and gold, but steel weapons and armor are amongst the best that dwarves can make, and this will help the military start training in preparation for when raids start to arrive as early as next year as long as we keep up this pace. Four swords dwarves volunteer for the squad, but they don't even have armor yet, so it'll be at least a short while before they're an effective fighting force. They'll train at the most rudimentary hole in the wall of a bear axe near the front of the fort. Uh, make that three swords dwarves. I don't even know what happened to the one of them. Maybe they died to something in the cavern while running there to get gear from a dead monster slayer? Well, that's all the proof I need to know that they need to start training now. Since all of that is going mostly well, it's time to start building out the best tavern I've ever made. It'll be located down a ramp from the front of the base. Progress on it will be a little bit slow since I'm currently hyper fixating on creating wealth to jumpstart the economy, but I really do plan to make this fort look a lot nicer than my often simpler affairs. As long as someone is working to impress dwarven merchants, I'm happy, though I won't say no to impress Pressing these human ones too. Their tales of wealth won't draw migrants, but we can still show off. 
figurines, goblets, and well-prepared meals make the traders agree that what we've got is already worth over a hundred thousand, just some 15 months in. We're almost halfway to the three-year mark and the two million goal, which makes me simultaneously feel like I've come so far and still have so, so far to go. I'll buy all of their leather, cloth, and food in exchange for a couple of meals. The newly bought plants will make for some fancy wines, and the other goods will be turned into meals and clothes to sell back to dwarven merchants in half a year. Though, maybe calling this fancy wine was being overly generous. Some of it is apparently called the oh-so-appetizing sewer brew. Back down below, Enith has made so many brass goblets that they're already a high master metal crafter after less than half a year on the job. That means they'll work faster and make higher quality goods, which is very useful because a masterfully made item sells for 12 times what a normally made one goes for. Ina's skill also means that they can transition to working on platinum instead of brass. Despite Ines' growing skill, the bedrooms are going to get cheap rock furniture. At least the common areas will get some nicer brass and silver furniture, since a few nice pieces there will go a long way. Goblets are much better for value though. One bar gets turned into three goblets, versus three bars for one throne worth less than a single goblet. Still, the happiness from seeing nice things will help them avoid issues with lunatics and depression down the line. When dwarves are Pressed, they do things like join cults called the Creed of Ash, which asks for a temple I'll promise for now, but wait to actually plan out until after I get to work on the first set of steel armor, a fully dug out tavern, and then still a while longer because I kind of maybe forgot about their request. In my defense, it's very easy to forget when there's a half-blind troll wandering through the fortress to grab some food and crundles crunching about near the metalworking. These little pests are getting getting in through the caverns, which really should have been monitored much more closely, and not just because some people are dying out there in gruesome pools of blood. Wait, there are two corpses here, and Logan the Miner thinks that he has a part in this. Up above, the wealth draws thieves who try to break in, but are promptly murdered by that small squad of swords dwarves that have been training diligently. The entrance to the cavern is cut off with a bridge that's pulled up, allowing access in and out when we want, that we'll definitely make sure is off limits for now. I sure hope no one important is outside. If it was basically anyone but Ken, the legendary carpenter, who's made more wealth than all but perhaps Eneth and Eton, they'd be staying out there. His role in impressing merchants is basically done now that metalworking is going, but he's done a good enough job that he deserves to retire. Autumn arrives, and the caravan comes soon after, but Ines actually been slacking on the production order to make platinum goblets. A firm reminder that their only priority is toiling in a subterranean sweatshop, kicks his butt into gear, and he heads back down into the depths to work on it after his little break for sleep and to take time off. The traders unpack while the official created wealth is just about 100,000, but Risen is still underestimating that, which you can see from that little question mark. When she shows the food, figurines, and goblets to the traders, they agree that what's here alone is worth over 200,000. We're at about halfway through the time point though, and while that is nearly double what we had for the human traders when they arrived last season, it still means that we have to increase the wealth nearly tenfold when we're already halfway through that first challenge. For now, we buy all of their instruments for the tavern, then all of their cloth and food to make into finished goods will show off next year. With the showing off done, it's time to work on improving the happiness that's got everyone depressed, except for one randomly super happy dwarf that just loves it here. A long-term project for that starts with the preparation for a pump stack that will draw water up for a mist generator, which is basically a huge waterfall of happiness that maybe sometimes drowns people. Don't worry about it though, that can't possibly happen this time. I'll also start on places for some rather fancy bedrooms 
you don't get a time lapse because it took almost a half hour. I wanted to try not just nestling these up against the caverns like I always do, so I made this artificial wandering tunnel system that I'll instead build through. There are also ramps up and down for five total levels of bedrooms, though it's going to take a long, long time to actually carve all of it out. A more short-term project is the actual tavern being designated, which is manned by the mayor and helped make special by a variety of performers. More migrants arrive, though these haven't yet been buoyed by tales of the impressive wealth dwarven merchants left with. They'll help smooth out space to ultimately make a temple for the religion I promised one to a while back. The blind ogre that distracted me then still just wanders about, but they're being peaceful, so let them. They seem to like the serenity of the religious space, though this is just a generic temple for now. Still, with how many dwarves rush here to pray, it's clearly still needed, while others dedicated to specific deities or groups will go in all around this. While all of that was taken care of, the first bouts of mining for bedrooms is almost done, and it's shaping up to look really cool cool even if it's still very messy. It's good enough that the homeland is willing to make this a proper barony already. Risen, who started this venture and has appraised every last good that made the homeland choose Orb's Woman in the first place, is the obvious choice. As a baroness, she wants some official rooms that work close to providing. The extra space above and below the main hallways for bedrooms are carved out in one area to see what it looks like, and then the rest of the area will be planned out. This is already a lot busier and messier than I'd imagined, but I think it'll look better once everything's actually in. As a barony, other forts are established nearby and economically linked to us, which means that I can expel people there and also ask for specific visitors back, though I'm not sure how much I'll actually use that feature. Harvesting all of the natural flora at the mouth of the fortress has afforded the dwarves some fancy boozes that they resume cooking with, though there still isn't enough of an influx of solid food items to constantly make lavish meals like I'd hoped. The geese just aren't quite productive enough. I'm not sure if there's just some sort of limit to how many animals you can have at a time. Still, wealth is created elsewhere, even if Enith is too busy making more brass furniture for the tavern to pump out platinum goblets at just this moment. The woodworking business for barrels and bins is so expansive that elves don't even give us a limit to chop like normal. They just outright leave a foreboding message because of our deforestation. Though that doesn't stop them from a immediately sending a caravan asking to trade, it seems like not even their pride will stop them from trying to slurp up the scraps that dwarven cooks and forges make. Monom the mayor directs them to bring their wagon directly over the huge wood stockpile they were just grumbling about before they get to the actual trading depot. Though, even if we did want to trade with them, we couldn't. All of the nice things this fortress has is stored in wooden barrels and bins, so the elves would be pissed if we tried to offer these up. If war were more profitable, I'd do it just to prove a point to them. But there's no reason to, so we'll just tell them that Risen is really, really busy, then ghost them out here at the trading depot. A forgotten beast tries to attack before the elves can, but it took a wrong turn and ended up in the waterlogged cavern with no entrance into the base, so it eventually turns back. Those normally preempt even more worrying attacks. In better news, the original gooselings that hatched late last year have finally grown into adults, which means the parents aren't much longer for this world. Perhaps fittingly, a human death butcher, which seems to be an elf that loves killing humans, visits the tavern. Despite the issues with happiness that the current measures haven't really fixed, a new migrant wave takes the fort from 66 to 91. In just two years, Orbs Women grew from just seven to almost a hundred, though they'll have to do a lot of work this last year to hit that first goal of having two million dwarf bucks of created value. This new wave is mostly less useful laborers like cheesemakers and shearers, but we need a lot of hauling, forging, and smoothing done anyways, so it's mostly fine. As much as the elves love to claim that nature's on their side, some birds steal from the caravan 
as they try to leave after not getting any dwarven goods. Without trading with them, I couldn't get a measure of the goods we have, and that little question mark still means that Risen is underestimating the fortress's value, but Eneth is about to start making fancier crafts, and as the kitchen gets back into the swing of things with freshly bushered geese, the wealth should increase pretty quickly now. Engravings will also help. An otherwise empty temple with just a gold altar worth 500 is altogether worth almost 5,000 because of some nice engravings. The legendary artist is going at it full time, further increasing the value of everything they touch. The steel armor industry also starts to kick up, and though these are worth less than crafts, it's still good value and more importantly, very useful. Guild halls are laid out to appease the farmers and hunters helping stock the kitchen, and the tavern is finally almost fully decked out with brass furniture. With that, Eneth switches to making platinum goblets full time. One platinum bar worth 200 is turned into three goblets worth at least 600 each, so this alone will bump the wealth up some 200,000 by the end of the year as they work the 100 platinum bars we have. Of course, the smelters are always making more which will further increase that. The better tavern is at least starting to make moods trend upwards, though it's still fairly split and leans negative for now. That should improve a lot when everyone has bedrooms, which are still being placed. At least that work keeps them busy when they aren't working in smitheries, though they are so productive there that Litast, the wannabe metal crafter who vied for Eneth's position by offering up an artifact, can start making brass goblets. They can train beside their mentor, since we have more than enough brass bars that Enith will never have time for, even if they would make slightly nicer goblets out of them. Really, we already have almost too many goblets. There's hundreds and hundreds of thousands worth of them for human traders, but we don't even need two full bins worth to buy all of their food, cloth, and other useful goods. The fortress's apparent wealth has gone up by a hundred thousand in less than a season, and the riches are in more than just stockpiles. Bards ask to join because the tavern is shaping up so wonderfully, with beautiful art everywhere you look, and nice if sparsely placed furniture all about. Tales of such wealth are sure to draw attacks, but the soldiers that have been dutifully training up are already already high masters at their craft. Because the squad only has people of similar skill, they're able to frequently spar, which gives better experience than other forms of training. A second squad, composed of a few hammer dwarves adept at bashing through armor, will start to train up alongside the current soldiers, using gear made in almost constantly active forges. Since war will mean injured, a simple hospital goes in close to the entrance, manned by some doctors who aren't looking forward to putting their somewhat rusty skills to use. In less grim news, smoothing out the main floor of bedrooms is finally almost done. This has taken months and months, but this should be some 80 bedrooms already at one time. In more grim news, the blind ogre that had peacefully wandered around the fortress for a year is senselessly murdered by a visiting human adventurer. You know how the saying goes, if you can reach the top shelf, you're a horrible person and a blight upon the world. Ignore the horrible miasma rotting all of the food because I messed up my stockpiles, and instead focus on how the fort has over a hundred dwarves after the latest migrant wave barely two years in. That's double the number I had at this point in my last run, and that gulf will only continue to grow over time as our wealth exponentially increases. Let's have those migrants. The complete rooms get a round of doors, and building like this means I have lots to place before... Hold on, goblins, I'll get to you in a second. Before I can even move on to placing beds. Oh, it's actually humans, not goblins, that came to attack. Half a dozen cowardly archers come to bring their brand of human evil to the doors. Fortunately, the swords dwarves that have ceaselessly trained rally out, and though outnumbered, easily cut through their foes without incurring any loss or injury. 
With attacks apparently imminent though, a squad of newbie spear dwarves starts to train up alongside the other soldiers. Autumn arrives, and the fortress's created wealth continues to quickly grow. They're up to over 300,000 in created wealth to show off to this year's caravan, which is helped in part by Kulet, the legendary weaponsmith, also starting to make brass goblets now, despite having no experience with metal crafting. We have brass bars to spare to train them, while Eneth focuses on making a plentiful plethora of platinum cups. Despite that, only some of the bedrooms have the full set of furniture, though that is slowly remedied over time as stoneworkers make it up above. The fortress boasts 110 people shortly before the liaison arrives, which is the exact number they're going to want to see to upgrade us from a village into a proper city. Since Risen is slowly getting better at appraising, she's much better at estimating the value of items worth even thousands, though our bins are worth enough that she still can't get a proper idea of them. The traders tell us this stuff is worth tens of thousands to Risen's few thousand, and in total, we bring them 79 of these bins. That's even only food and goblets, not other valuables like gems and armor, and it's still more than enough to impress the diplomats, officially earning Orbswoman the fourth highest title. More economically linked sites are added to the holdings, from which we could request a good administrator and a good soldier if we needed, but won't ask anything of for now. Now. Between that wealth, the other bins we didn't show off, and the roughly 200,000 the dwarves boast in architecture and worn wealth they can't show, the fortress is at around 1 million dwarf bucks created with just 2 months left. It sounds like that first goal is impossible, but we have added 700,000 in the last 6 months, so it might just be doable. But it's time to actually give people their first bedroom. Orbs women's priorities might be a little bit out of whack since we're millionaires just now giving people their first bedrooms, but this isn't enough for everyone, so I add more rooms above and below the main floor. There's space for literally hundreds of dwarves, so everyone can be housed without problems once this is all done. At least the current homos drink from gold goblets made by metalsmiths who rightfully request a guild. But given the state of happiness here, I'm going to instead focus on the mist generator now that the pieces for the pump stack, which will lift water up to where it's needed, are finally almost ready after so, so long. Miners carve a small drainage ditch near the cavernous water, which feeds to this alternating T column all the way up to the top, from which it will drip down a channel and towards a few places over the tavern. The tavern itself will have some dugout spaces with grates that act as drainage, feeding a long vertical shaft on the left that runs all the way to drain out back into the cavern from which we got the liquid in the first place. Before it's complete, the draining in the legendary dining room to be still has those slightly hazardous holes which need grates, but before putting them in, it's time to decorate the grates with gems. Now, everyone can drink easy knowing that every step they take is dirtying something precious. The next step in the mist generator's pump stack, which lifts water up to where it's needed, is to alternate channeling out the floor at specific places. This lets a screw pump suck water up one level into the 3x1 area, from which it can be sucked up by the next screw pump. Rinse and repeat up as far as needed. Adults will build that, while the rest of the labor is kept going by the veritable child labor factory we've got going on to help out the metal workers. Sorry kids, but money does not print itself. The third year begins with an attack by some filthy goblins, but they aren't nearly as important as looking at the wealth. Risen can still only appraise about 300,000 in created wealth, apart from the finished goods she still underestimates. But by using a utility in DF hack to temporarily make her a perfect appraiser, we can see the true wealth of the fortress, and we just barely squeaked out the 2 million gold. The meals, bins, and quite literally thousands of goblets add up to a total value of over 1.6 million. Now, we just have to defend that wealth from amped up raids scaling to it, while achieving the second goal, earning the game's highest rank. We're currently a mere barony, 
Not bad, but not great either. The first step to becoming a mountain home is to become the empire's capital by attracting the king, which we do by being the richest and nicest fortress in the world. The explosion of wealth we've had is going to slow down now, since we're almost out of the precious metals that Enith turned into goblets, but those remnants and the other more sustainable items like meals should do the job. There's still plenty more story to come, but before we get to that, I want to talk about the stories in this video's sponsor. Audible has the largest collection of audiobooks with fantastic tales of their own. The format is perfect for throwing on before settling into a good game like Dwarf Fortress. I started getting into Discworld while recording footage for this video, and I'm brushing up on Spanish for a trip soon while it works. Quieres intentarlo? Use my affiliate link in the description to sign up for a free 30-day trial and get one free audiobook of your choice. If you don't like it, cancel any time at no cost. Back to my story. This new wealth attracts a group of raiders that aren't nearly as greedy as I expected. They want to parlay, which is a solid no, so our soldiers stop sparring for, well, Rigoth, this is a kind of striking demonstration. The fight is fast enough, but the dwarves give the eerie feeling that someone else is there, and that the siege is still on, even though not one of them see other enemies about. After claiming their victory, one of our soldiers just suddenly drops dead from what must have been a bad injury that took them down before they could get rushed to the hospital. Not even going out to kill a forgotten beast in the caverns helps ease the worry that they're being besieged by something. A swamp titan comes from above ground to add to that threat, kills a bard, but dies to two swings from the legendary swords dwarf Rigoth. That's the power of good training that a would-be thief also learns soon after. I knew that Tales of Wealth would draw more attacks, but that's four in less than two months. They hadn't been too strong just yet, but they'll continue to grow more fearsome as Tales of This Wealth spread wider still. In better news, the brass grates for the tavern have a lot of gems on them. I don't think there's a limit to this, but we've used nearly all of the gemstones the fortress has found in three years and added thousands to the value of each of the six grates. Uh, why is the tavern covered in vomit? No, seriously, everyone's just socializing like nothing's wrong, while the place is covered in this sickly green. Not even all of our meals can possibly overpower that smell. Ah, they still think there's a siege here, even though I swear there isn't, and people apparently don't clean during those by default. Well, let's wash it away with a mist generator. I finished the pump stack off screen by placing screw pumps up level by level, each built upon the last and they'll get power from a vertical axle that goes from the highest screw pump up to the surface before being connected to a bunch of windmills. There really isn't much wind here, so the 60-ish pumps draw a lot of power these windmills will have to provide. Once they're built, the entire pump stack transmits power all the way through and starts drawing up water, which the next pump up immediately sucks. It travels up the stack level by level, then down the shaft at the top and towards the tavern until... Why do enemies always attack when I'm trying to get cool shots or plan things out? The soldiers go handle that while I notice that the water which should be draining away really isn't. I can fix that, but I can't fix two soldiers who just drop dead for no apparent reason in their barracks. The tavern's grates are moved to be directly beneath the holes above, which helps the room drain, but even with some standing pools soaking everyone's socks, the dining room itself is already legendary thanks to the art, beautiful sights, and copious amounts of booze here. Though the elves avoided us this year thanks to our taste for wood, human merchants arrive near the start of summer, and we have so, so much to trade. All of this is only for one type of wood too. We have a total of 122 bins, each worth a couple of thousand. Throwing everything up here puts up nearly 2 million in the trade window. With the almost 400,000 in architecture, equipment, clothes, and placed furniture, we're about halfway to adding another million to the coffers already, but such a rich fortress should be fixed up to befit it. The mist generator is working, but a mistake with the planning means that it's draining towards the bedrooms and not the intended ditch. That can be fixed with a bit of civil engineering though, and at least people are relieved and happy to be near it now. 
Between that and other improvements like temples, bedrooms, and the amazing dining room full of gem encrusted floor grates people just love to look at, happiness is really starting to trend upwards. Though the mayor is admittedly embarrassed because they're lacking pretty much all of the accommodations they would want for their work. Some of the space that had already been cleared out in pursuit of flux stone is going to be repurposed into their office and dining room. More sets of steel armor are queued up to add to the 20 the dwarves already boast, which should help as the military is further expanded. Though actually having gear to use doesn't stop Ast from acting like wearing a helmet makes you soft. Bedrooms are filled out on more of the levels, and even though only half the space is actually being used, that's already enough for nearly 80 dwarves on each floor, which is more than enough for basically ever. I think this whole design was overkill. It should sleep somewhere around 700 dwarves, and my computer cannot handle that. With more armor underway, a few of the less experienced soldiers take up the axe. They're good all-around weapons that'll complement the spears, hammers, and swords that soldiers currently wield. The other squads are woefully undermanned at this point, but there aren't any good soldiers using the weapons they specialize in, and adding a few newbies would just have more experienced soldiers giving them lessons, instead of the more useful sparring amongst themselves. I'll also go ahead and add a crossbow squad with a few of the experienced hunters and other random shooters, then carve out an archery range for them to train at. Rangers will definitely help some of my future goals. Monom the mayor gets her private rooms, and though their sterile dining room is especially worse than the public alternative, the prestige of having a private dining room is at least worth something to them. In Grim news, tombs are carved out amongst the stone left from strip mining ore veins to both bury those that have already died and to prepare for the future. The bulk of the fortress, meanwhile, is going to start working on an ambitious project in the main bedroom floor. I really wanted this design to look nice, but it's just kind of a huge mess. And I don't just mean the flooding that's there because past me fixed it improperly three separate times. I think I have a solution for just how visually messy it is but it involves laying brickwork on the path for everything, which will both take thousands of stone bricks and has to be manually set up. The rustic bauxite goes on the right, and the lovely blue hues of microcline is there on the left. Autumn arrives, which means that it's time for the annual scurry of dwarves bringing all the finished good bins to the trade depot for the semi-annual show of wealth. The millions we have to offer is why Orbswoman leads a bunch of small hillocks around their central fort to serve as a counterbalance to the elves in the ongoing war. If the tall folk push to the west to try and sandwich dwarves against the mountains, we'll ride in from the north, or we would if we could be bothered. War is expensive and time consuming even though we're already well equipped for it. The Swords Dwarves are legendary fighters, and the Hammer Dwarves aren't too far behind. Those wielding spears are newer, but are still training up well. In fact, the Swords Dwarves keep their gear on, but take well-deserved time off to pursue more civilian desires. As long as they train every once in a while to stop from being rusty, there's nothing they can get from constantly being on alert. If war comes to our door, however, the chief medical dwarf Olan will need soap for the hospital, which currently can't really clean wounds. That starts on the surface with a soap maker shop, an ashery, and a wood furnace to make soap from logs burned to ash, and press quarry bushes farmed down in the caverns. In grimmer news, we're finally out of platinum nuggets to turn into bars. We have some 100 ingots left, plus the nearly 300 worth we've turned into goblets, but the single largest contributor to wealth, more than 600,000 in total, is almost dried up. Killing some elves sounds like a good way to wipe away the tears. They're here from the war, though there are only a dozen of them, and since they love to use wooden gear, this might not have been their best decision. Rigoth, the militia commander, doesn't even make it all the way out to them before the other soldiers training near the entrance cut them down without injury. It's good practice for the less experienced Ags dwarves and every good dwarf should know how to cut down an elf. It's about time that such a magnanimous city gets a throne room to call its own. 
and the reason is growingly apparent before the first wall even goes in as the seventh holding nearby pops up. Well, let's get ready to welcome their diplomats in a throne room full of brass seats and tables with room for visitors and engravings that mark the path in to appease my symmetry-obsessed brain. Before everything's even carved and placed, the room is already considered opulent because of how expansive it is and the few engravings that are already there. There's still a little more to add, and as if on cue, Irvod makes a wonderful artifact brass door that will serve as the entrance to the nearby special tomb for the Duchess Risen. She also gets a dining hall that's spacious but frankly fairly uninspired next to the tavern. With that, Riven only needs her bedroom to be spruced up to be happy with her lot. The rest of the bedroom floors are still being worked on, though cutting and placing all the blocks has been an even more long-term project than I expected. The tavern, meanwhile, is already nice enough to occasionally draw undead creatures who come for a casual little visit. Though while it's getting some new flooring to cover up the mud, now that plumbing is finally fixed, the world officially enters the Age of Legends. I'm not going to take full responsibility for it, but only because I know my viewers are naturally smart enough to come to that obvious conclusion. The fourth year comes to an end, but Winter's bitter chill doesn't even have time to fully leave before Orbswoman gets the honor of hosting the king. He chose to live here over every other site he could reside in, and promptly announces that Orbswoman is now the capital. Risen isn't exactly pleased that she isn't the head honcho here anymore, but this is the start of Orbswoman going down in dwarven history as a true mountain home, the greatest amongst all dwarven civilizations. It's just a little bit awkward that this step happens while we're planning out tombs and while a rotting goblin corpse in the entrance spews miasma. The king is willing to overlook those, but demands rooms even nicer than what Risen has. And while we start sorting those out now, he can have some of the legendary jewelry we've made to appease him in the meantime. Maybe don't tell the king that the friendly demon adventurer is back to get his punch card stamped yet again though. Instead, tell him that a wonderfully expansive throne room is carved out, complete with a nearby dining room, bedroom, and a tomb for when his long life naturally comes to an end. Everyone floods in to get to work smoothing the stone. Ina, the legendary metal crafter that's led the blossoming economy since Orbswoman's founding, uses some of the last platinum bars to make thrones and tables for the king's rooms. Litast, who's a legendary crafter by now thanks to the dozen crates full of brass goblets they've made, focuses on brass furniture for the rest of the fortress's common areas. Kubik, the master engraver, eagerly works to add intricate art to the king's spaces, while some of the nicest furniture yet is given to the king to store everything he might have. Work progresses, and the king is gradually satiated until, finally, he's happy with his accommodations. But greed runs deep in a dwarf's blood, and he wants more. This is the final and hardest step of becoming a mountain home. Giving the king what he wants, and finding unearthly metals deep beneath the ground to appease them. In addition to seven of those, I'll have to make a throne from Adamantine. And accomplishing both of those will involve a lot of exploring in the heated depths. Are we sure that bedrooms aren't good enough for him? Because these are looking pretty good. No? No? Okay, fine. The bottom of the fort gets a kind of checkpoint dugout, which has a line of fortifications on one side of a bridge that will hopefully keep everyone safe if slash when things go wrong. A second way into a further bunker is dug out above, and then a second line of fortifications go in. Archers can shoot through these safely from the left side, and any unsavory enemies where the bridge is might not be able to hit back. While that's all built, and that bridge takes a good amount of time, migrants arrive. 
But though the fortress only draws some six migrants, it also only draws half a dozen goblin raiders. Maybe tales of wealth need more time to spread. As is, asked the militia captain is essentially able to handle this entirely on his own. No, the bigger threat to Orb's woman is that the brass has finally been all smelted down after nearly four years of having two smelters going full time. Over a thousand brass bars were made, of which some 800 have been turned into goblets. Fortunately, there are still plenty of steel and iron to make bolts for crosswomen that head down to the bunker to watch over a miner digging towards a spire of obsidian and adamantine that will have the divine metals the king seeks. There are big dangers here, but the archers lining up are incredible incredibly skilled from years of hunting and some practice in the archery range. The first obstacle is a small underground lake the miners open up easily enough, which shows a more dangerous pocket of lava hidden by warm stone. The miners will have to carefully navigate around these or just clear them out and let it flood and run off. It'll evaporate and burn off in time. And that's a good break for soldiers who have been perched at the bridge since, but time passes, they've had a drink and a good nap, and they were turned down so that miners can resume work on other floors when the ones they're currently on have been flooded. The divine metals that the king missed them once are interspersed here in the obsidian and gem studded pillars, which means I'll be digging into them on every level I can find. Unfortunately, magma pits are still common, and while miners are able to run almost every time, it slows down work pretty consistently. Consistently. The most recent spill is huge enough that soldiers go on break as mining has to come to a halt, or most of one. I must have forgotten to cancel some orders because an ancient horror that was sealed away is unleashed by a miner that dies to its claws mere moments later. The serpentine creature floods out, and though the military rushes back down from their post to handle it, they can't get there before it runs up the staircase and murders exactly one more dwarf. The former king's tomb is going to be used sooner than later. Orb's woman remains the capital, and we can continue doing what the late Mistum wanted by digging back down into the obsidian and gems to appease the new king Vabok. Oh, he doesn't care about anything, Risen doesn't care about anything, the old king didn't care. Why do all of my leaders just give up on the world? Hopefully Vabok is at least a little bit roused by adamantine which is an incredibly valuable, nigh impervious, but difficult to work metal the miners unleash. It isn't the focus though, since we only need one throne made out of it, and miners only slowly chip away at it, while craft dwarf shops are put in near the forges to process this into strands that can ultimately be made into adamantine ingots. We only get what's incidentally mined out in search of the ancient artifacts that will elevate Orbswoman to a proper dwarven mountain home. Now, what happens next actually involves some pretty heavy spoilers for the game, so if you're a newer Dwarf Fortress player who doesn't know what the circus is, I'd really recommend you stop watching even though the YouTube algorithm probably hates me for saying that. You've got about 10 seconds before spoilers hit. For the rest of you, miners searching for little pockets with an unearthly artifact tucked away, instead find a long tunnel down. Down and down and down. So far down that they don't hear but echoes of the horrendous screeches that fill the whole fortress with an eerie cacophony. A miner peering over the edge just barely makes out the red and black glow of these terrifying monstrosities. We have just unleashed literal hell upon ourselves. They start charging up the tunnels and there are hundreds of them. Some spit webs while others use claws to tear through everyone there. But before being able to pour into the fortress, they find a raised bridge that they just respect enough to not break down. Crossbowmen pelt them through the fortifications. It's slow work, since these are the toughest enemies in the game, but their ichor is spilled as skilled dwarves fire again and again and again. 
the bridge would break if I tried to use it to atom smash them, and even legendary soldiers in great gear would be torn to ribbons if they didn't heavily outnumber these foes. So what amounts to carefully engineered cheese is all that will keep the dwarves alive. Since that involves at least hundreds of bolts, the legendary armorsmith is kicked from their station so that a second legendary weaponsmith can start making steel ammo full time. This is very expensive, but we do have the resources for it and I shudder to think how long this would take with mere iron or worse, bone. It's already been long enough that some of the crossbow dwarves nap on the floor in between bouts of shooting after exhaustion sets in. That's good enough reason to cancel the orders for now so they can rest up and recover in their bedroom. Even that brief span of shooting was enough to cover the floor in blood and leave some of them seriously injured. This is a marathon, not a sprint, and it's one we have to take carefully. The captain, Mistum, literally falls asleep on the stairs up to his bedroom after all of the adrenaline wears off. I actually take the time to add bedrooms down near the conflict just for the crossbow dwarves to have a shorter commute. The security concerns understandably delayed Babok's coronation, but it's time for him to get his royal dues. He's a strong, calm, and pessimistic alcoholic who hasn't been able to recover from trauma he underwent years prior. His inability to find things to care about is even rubbing off on some kids who also don't seem to mind that they're playing just a stone's throw from literal hell beasts. Let's get back to cleaning those up. Though some archers hate to pick up bolts and fill their quivers. Others go drink water from a pond on the surface even though we have tons of booze. Fortunately, resetting their squad at least makes them refill their quivers, though they go for bone bolts even though I explicitly forbade all of those already. I really feel like I have to be missing something with how archers are supposed to work, but after a few weeks delays, most eventually return to shooting off bolts and even mark a few kills that leave ashy corpses. Mark's dwarves are kinda stupid but they're also incredibly effective and the only way to deal with something like this. A nearby ammo stockpile partially alleviates their bad decision making and they start to spit out more and more steel bolts into the ever-growing rotting pile of hellacious corpses. Eventually, they kill everything at the opening, though there are plenty more still hiding away. There are also a ton of visiting nobles here eager to meet the new king. I would have chosen to wait until the hell rift is closed to visit, but dwarves are just brave like that. There's still some 20 of the creatures here, which is still way too many for a fair fight. But to clear them out, I'm going to have to lure them in, which involves digging beneath the bridge currently blocking their path then building another bridge down there. I unassign the talented miners, including our king, then get a bunch of less important newbies assigned to the job. After giving one a single file line to mine out to draw exactly them here, I pull the lever behind to lock them in. Don't panic, Oozle. You're going to scare the child playing make-believe on the other side of the bridge. Focus on mining some totally random stairs. Gotta have those stairs up for- Oh no! Who could have seen this coming? I made a huge mistake, and she dug up into the beast, who charged into archer fire to kill her. Oh, what a horrible tragedy that no one could have predicted. At least it'll never happen again. Oh no! Oh, the second time- what a silly axe! Oh, and a third! Oh no! Hey, hey, hey! You weren't supposed to run away and drag monsters out of archer fire. Die with some dignity. But with Hell's forces thinned out, it's time for the mass of legendary soldiers at the gate to lower the bridge. They gang up on the first Hell Beast and slaughter it with a single punch. The other beasts are just content to sit back and wait. There are still more waiting in the spire too, but they're all equally chill. Even the attacking goblin force is calm enough to attempt parlay, though after we reject that, it's a quick and brutal affair. 
back below, miners are once again sacrificed to bait the creatures out. For the viewer's sensitivity, I'm just gonna hide what happens behind this menu. No, actually they live, though the beast definitely took out a chunk of them before the military got there. The other hell beasts are baited out with stairs up to them, which leads miners to them. And though a few die, the soldiers are so fearsome that the enemy flees as fast as they can. The threat isn't quite gone before the official 5th anniversary of Orbswoman passes, with the fort valued at just over 3 million. I've really slacked off on making food since hitting the mark 2 years ago, and we're out of precious metal to turn into goblets, but the armor, bolts, and other goods have carried us over this mark. We just need to finish beating hell, explore around the spire, and become a true mountain home. A divine spider interrupts progress on that front to come down into the midst of soldiers, but it continues to flee downwards towards hell. Soldiers pursue it there, but it's a treacherous descent, and the spider is more suited to these narrow tunnels. It scores kills after kill, but the soldiers eventually manage to take it down, albeit at a heavy cost. Half of the hammer dwarves and all but one of the spear dwarves died to the beast. But with that, the map is officially clear of hellacious creatures. Orbswoman has literally defeated the demon underworld just after five years after coming here. It's more than anyone could have hoped or expected. Miners can return to looking for unearthly metals here. There's still some potential risk to other divine beings locked here, but it doesn't take long for them to find the first artifact, a metal mitten which frankly just sounds plain uncomfortable, but the king wants it. It is mildly valuable though. The miners find a second, third, and fourth, which are all assigned to the monarch. Barring the occasional lava flood, which traps unfortunate miners, a kid pushing over a wagon, which is not a notification I've ever seen in a thousand hours of this game, and ghostly miners returning to haunt the fortress for reasons I can't imagine, work is pretty productive. They find a 5th, 6th, and 7th such artifact, and they're all assigned to the king. All that's left to do is make an adamantine throne from bars each processed by careful craft stores and smelters. Every one is worth 1500 and we need 9, but once we do, the legendary Eneth, who's more fit than anyone else in the world, gets to work making this. It's kind of disappointing. 13,000 worth of materials for an expertly made loss of nearly 9,000, but it's still placed in his throne room, and as the king meditates on jewels, he immediately realizes what's been done. Orbswoman is finally an official mountain home, the most prestigious rank and a literal legend amongst dwarven kind. Better still, it took just over five years to reach this point. Its tremendous growth made possible by a splendid set of dwarves. I thought wealth would draw worse threats than what came, but I think I'm just spoiled by constantly being at war and settling more dangerous lands in most of my playthroughs. My next couple of videos are going to feature suitably brutal challenges, so I remember just how fun it is to lose, like a tile-locked fortress I've been testing out. Still, becoming a mountain home was something I've never done before, and I hope you enjoyed it too. If so, drop the video a like to help me out with YouTube's algorithm. Then subscribe so you don't miss what comes next.